Hi, this is Matt McCormick. <clears throat> I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. Uh, this is my first lecture for my Philosophy of Mind course, Phil 153, the first lecture on eliminative materialism. Okay, so um, some background to tie us back to some of the theories we started with in the semester and to lay some groundwork here we've already seen that theories of mind are typically dualist or they're monist that is they will adopt the view that there's two basic kinds of stuff or one basic kind of stuff in the world um, and one of the monist views obviously is materialism that is to say only material stuff exists so whatever minds are where they're made of must just be made of physical matter so the one basic kind of stuff out of which everything is made is physical matter, this materialism. And um, uh, we're going to look at eliminative materialism. So it's a particular species of materialism that says a lot of the concepts, a lot of the entities that we stipulate or postulate that exist in the world actually need to be eliminated. All right, so eliminative theories. Um, and sometimes I'll just refer to these guys as EM theorists. Eliminative theorists. Theories are ones that argue on the basis of the history of science and empirical investigation that many of the common sense terms we have regarding mind, such as belief, desire, will, even consciousness itself, should be eliminated from a correct theory of mind. All right, so there's some historical precedent here, and you'll see what it is in just a minute. I'm going to build an argument by analogy. So a bit of history about the philosophy of science and about uh, the history of science. Here's what happens. Scientific inquiry into some new subject, into some uh, topic of which we're interested in history, typically leads to revisions in our descriptions or our models of what's real and the theory in which the terms we start with are embedded. So we start out at, you know, at the first point in, in a scientific inquiry, and we think, oh, well, there's some phenomena, there's some thing there that needs to be investigated. I need to figure out what that is. But many times that actual investigation um, forces us to undergo some radical conceptual or belief change, and we end up abandoning the very notion, the very concepts that we started with when we embarked on the original investigation. The thing we thought we were investigating just evaporates in our hands. So I'll give you some examples of both. Um, and then here's another way about, uh, another point about how um, our concepts and their, their definitions get changed over time. So we're going to talk about both kinds of views, views that eliminate uh, concepts from the past and ones that revise concepts from the past. So as we learn more, we often change the terms, we change their definitions, and we change the theory they are embedded in, sort of rebuilding the ship that we're floating in. So for example, uh, you know the example of uh, a geocentric uh, universe versus a heliocentric universe. So um, uh, pre-Copernicus, the Ptolemaic worldview was that the Earth was at the center of the universe, and, and then we made the, all of these observations. And as we got better and better at observing the stars in the sky, the movement of the stars in the sky um, started to not add up, sort of not quite make sense according to our theory, our, theory, our geocentric view, this idea that the Earth is in the middle and the Sun and all the planets are orbiting around the Earth. And these sort of observational anomalies added up to the point where we couldn't hold on to the theory anymore. We had to give it up. We had to throw it out and revise and put the Sun at the center and have the Earth go around the, uh, go around the Sun. Okay, so that's just a very classic standard example about how uh, concepts and theories undergo change over time as we make investigations. Um, sometimes the term that we start using survives, but what it labels ends up being radically different by the time we're done. So a really good EM example here is that the ancient Greeks used this word atom to mean, by definition, that which cannot be split into any smaller parts. So an atom is a thing by its, you know, like a bachelor is an unmarried um, adult human male. An atom to the Greeks was the most fundamental, unsplittable um, unit of reality. <clears throat> the most basic kind of item, um, you know, particle in the universe. 
So for them, you could no more split an atom than you could marry a bachelor. To split a thing is to demonstrate that it's not an atom. That must not be what we're after if you can split it. But of course, by the time we get done with our inquiry into what we thought were atoms, you know, well into the 19th and 20th century, um, we still use the term, we talk about atoms, we talk about the atomic table, but we don't mean that those stand for, or that those are indivisible, singular uh, pieces of matter. We regularly split them now. Um, atomic bombs split atoms, which on a Greek view would be logically impossible. Such a thing's incoherent. doesn't make sense at all. Okay, so what did we do in that case? We kept the word, but we re revised what we meant by the word. So that's a... Uh, a, a more ontologically conservative way to incorporate uh, the expansion of our knowledge and keep some of the framework that we started with. Okay, so the question then we're asking is, how should our theories, our terms, our tools, and methods of investigation respond to discovery? As we uh, discover more about what's going on in the world, what do we do with the scaffolding that got us there? Uh, very often we have to make some pretty dramatic changes in the conceptual structure, the theory, uh, the, the principles, the ideas that, that, that led to the inquiry from the start. Um, okay, so uh, I'll give you another example. And this is somewhat idealized uh, to make the point, uh, but it'll make the argument very well. And I, I want you to remember it later. So this is an example having to do with figuring out what the nature of heat is. Okay, so concepts undergo radical transformations from their beginnings in scientific inquiries. If the shift is dramatic enough, we just eliminate the concept in question. Okay, so you might imagine a very old, a very sort of pre-scientific inquiry into, let's say, fire, like a caveman inquiry into fire. So on the old view, the old concept of fire, it would be natural, it would be intuitive or common sense even to lump together burning wood, burning coal, the sun, lightning, uh, northern lights, fireflies, comets. You'd look at all of those things and superficially you might think, oh, well, those all have something to do with fire. Fire, if it's a thing in the world, and surely it is, it must be, uh, it's in those things. And whatever I end up saying about what the nature of fire is, it's got to incorporate or fold all those in. Um, and then at the at the outset, at the sort of beginning of our inquiry, um, if we were to look at, say, rust um, happening on metal, or calcification happening, uh, chemical, chemically happening in the world, or if you noticed, um, you know, body metabolism, uh, bodies getting hotter when they're uh, when when they're fevered, or getting colder when you know, and in other circumstances, um, we sh surely at the beginning of our inquiry wouldn't think that those classify as anything like what fire is. That's not fire on a caveman view. Uh, those phenomena that we observe in the world. Um, okay, so uh, if again, if the shift is dramatic enough, then we eliminate. So what happens next? Well, ultimately, um, we arrive at a modern. Uh, view of heat, which is not fire, but it's related. And on the new view, the new account of heat, um, that becomes a measure of the mean molecular motion or kinetic energy of the molecules in a substance. Um, and I haven't looked at my all my sorry, history of science on this, but sort of the modern view and the way you you test this in your you know uh, college physics class or chemistry class is you define heat this way, and um, now we have a way to understand heat as we see it as it occurs in a pan that's on the stove or um, a hot poker that's in the fire or lots of these other phenomena. What do they all have in common? They all have this high level of kinetic energy in their molecules. Okay, well molecules kinetic energy energy, um, none of those concepts are available in the ca caveman account or the original account. And see, on the new view then, um, now we can, uh, on, on what we come to understand heat to be, we can say that burning wood and burning coal have um, high degrees of heat. Um, and then it turns out that rust or calcification are also forms of oxidation. And in a broader theory, um, Mean, heat as mean molecular motion is connected to oxidation, which is something that happens chemically on um, uh, uh, in objects in the world. And uh, in, chem in a chemistry class, we divide oxidation into fast or slow oxidation. They have different rates. So it turns out that rust, calcification, body metabolism, they have a theoretic 
um, uh, uh, a conceptual connection to burning wood and burning coal. Things that we didn't think had anything to do with fire at the outset turn out to be connected to uh, mean molecular motion and oxidation and what's happening as um, uh, uh, objects uh, oxidize. Okay, and then furthermore, um, perhaps even more disconcertingly to the fire or to the uh, caveman, is all these other things that these other phenomena, new phenomena like the fireflies, like biophosphorescence or reflected sunlight, those don't have anything to do with heat. Um, nuclear fusion is a different phenomena. Thermal emission, spectral emission, those are all new. So as we move through time, we start with an original concept, conceptual structure that says these things are fire, these things are not fire. And then ultimately, as we develop and build a theory, it realigns our concepts and tells us a different story about what the nature of things are in the world. Okay, so remember that transition and that development or evolution of concepts over time because uh, what the eliminative materialists want to say is we we at the very least should be very cautious about operating with our old school uh, caveman notions of what it is to have a mind or what's in the mind or the nature of the mind. They're going to argue that um, uh, much of our modern mind talk uh, our folk psychology is um, like that old uh, pre-scientific investigation into fire. And, and it would be best to eliminate or radically revise it. Okay, so the question then is, do we revise or do we eliminate in the face of discovery? Our language and our causal theories about nature, they shouldn't be static or a priori. We can't just stand our ground. You don't want to just like be an ancient Greek and go, no, those aren't atoms you're splitting. I mean, we, we turn over... Um, and we make a, an exchange for the new ideas. Um, they must be informed by our investigations and new discoveries. That new information requires us to revise the definition of the term. Um, the Greek atom was an indivisible, singular, constituent part of matter, but a modern atom is a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons are surrounded by a cloud of electrons. They have parts. Modern atoms have parts, despite the the sort of definition problem that that would have on a Greek account. Okay, so we still use the term, but we have radically different worldviews to explain what they are. Okay, so, so a few other examples. Um, medieval doctors, for instance, believed that illness could be addressed through the practice of numerology, among other things, and astrology. Um, and uh, the, for, my, for my purposes, I won't pursue those right now, but also... Uh, medieval doctors, or maybe they're better called healers, right? They're, even the notion of doctor doesn't really apply here because they're doing something very different. They're more like an astrologist. You don't call it an astrologist, or you don't conceive of an astrologist the way you conceive of a modern doctor. So on their view, their theory is that the body had four humors, which are these three or four different kinds of basic fluids. Um, there was uh, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. So you got these four basic kinds of fluids. Um, and then there's also vital spirits, and fluids can be hot or wet or dry or cold. Um, and what's happening when someone is sick, according to the, sort of the medieval account, is that there's an imbalance or there's a, there's a, uh, a disturbance in the four basic humors. Uh, there's something wrong with your black bile. You've got too much of it, or you've got too little yellow bile or something. So their treatment then of patients was guided by these concepts. They used that theory and those entities, of course, with spectacularly bad results. You've got these people sort of blindly groping in the dark, um, maybe doing your astrology forecast, um, maybe thinking there's some sort of magical numerical connection between, you know, the number of people in your family and how soon you got the disease. I mean, even the notion of disease doesn't really fit here. I mean, they knew what the plague, they knew the plague was the plague, but it wasn't a disease the way we think of disease. You wouldn't swap out um, if you came down with bubonic plague. You wouldn't possibly swap out um, a medieval, a 13th century French uh, healer for a 21st century Johns Hopkins trained um, uh, virologist, right, to treat you. Um, okay, so what did we do in the case of humors? Well, we eliminated. This took 600 more years for modern bacterial and viral theory of disease to develop, 
And then we eliminate demon possession and the story of the four humors in favor of an account that says uh, it's a particular kind of bacterial infection, Yersinia pestis. That's what causes bubonic plague. But the conceptual framework and the theory wasn't even in place for another 600 years for us to be able to say something like that, to be, even be able to correctly describe it. So now when somebody gets uh, bubonic plague, we know exactly what it is, and we treat it with antibiotics. Um, uh, and that's why we've effectively eliminated it. The, the treatment goes much better now than you're getting your astrology forecast uh, to, treat it, to treat it, to address it. Um, and I'm deliberately getting jabs in on uh, those of you who are sympathetic to astrology. I got more bad things to say about it. Okay, so more examples. Um, are, these, are these cases of demon possession, or is this mental illness, or something else? Um, suppose we observe, uh, so, and these passages that I've got down here on the left are examples of Jesus healing and casting demons out of people in the first century in Palestine. Um, Jesus threw out a lot of demons. Um, suppose we observe erratic behavior, muscle tremors, erratic movements, delusions, hallucinations, disassociated states, auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, or seizures. You know, um, today you'll drive down uh, Stockton, perhaps, and you'll see somebody on the street who's got all of those symptoms. So imagine that guy, um, somebody who's homeless and mentally ill, doesn't have any medications, or maybe he's drug addicted or something, and he's having uh, hallucinations, erratic behavior, he's staggering around in the street. Now imagine taking that guy and dropping him into a first century context. What would sheep, illiterate sheep herders in the first century in um, Palestine think was wrong with that guy? What, what conceptual framework, what theory would be available to them to explain what's wrong with him, what's right with him, how to fix him, what to do with him? Um, so your theory, of course, in that kind of case, the theory that, that Jesus applied is that the victim is inhabited by a powerful, malevolent, supernatural being the demon must be cast out with some form of benevolent magic. And, you know, there's still people around who believe this. There's lots of demon uh, casting out happening all over the place. The people I've got on the right there, um, the one on the top right is somebody who's being sort of overwhelmed by some powerful feelings of sort of uh, 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 religious uh, uh, ecstasy. And then the ones on the bottom right are actually audience members at an Oprah uh, taping. Um, I think Oprah's just given them all a car or something. And they're, you know, overwhelmed with joy and excitement and so on. Um, uh, best not to cast the demons out of them. Uh, but there are still people in the 21st century having um, faith healing sessions and casting out demons. Okay, now are those real? Or is that mental illness? Um, clearly a modern eliminative materialist, a modern doctor, somebody working in psych psychiatrics um, would say that the problem here is mental illness. And we understand that differently than um, they did in the first century. You know, a modern psychiatrist is going to consult the DSM-4 to try to figure out and identify the, the um, symptoms and then going to use their training to treat that with drugs and therapy and the like. Um, and here, just as a side note on the topic of religious experience, here's a passage, a long passage, I'm sorry, but a really good passage from an article about uh, the neural substrates of religious experience. And this, I find this just as amazing. Um, religious experience, they argued, the authors argued, is brain-based, like all human experience. Clues to the neural substrates of religious numinous experience may be gleaned from temporal limbic epilepsy, near-death experiences, and hallucin hallucinogen ingestion. Uh, these brain disorders and conditions may produce depersonalization, uh, derealization, ecstasy, a sense of timelessness and spacelessness and other experiences that foster religious numinous interpretation. Religious delusions are an important subtype of delusional experience, and schizophrenia and mood-congruent religious delusions are a feature of mania and depression. The authors suggest a limbic marker hypothesis for religious mystical experience. The temporal limbic system tags certain encounters with external or internal stimuli as depersonalized, <clears throat> derealized, crucially important, harmonious, and or joyous, prompting comprehension of these experiences within a religious framework. So there's a modern um, psychiatric analysis of the brain source of what 
a thousand years ago or um, two thousand years ago would have been utterly inexplicable or inexplicable in any kind of account except perhaps oh why is that guy acting that way why are you having those feelings why are you having this powerful set of uh, hallucinations it's obvious that God's speaking to you. It's obvious that you're tapping in to some other plane of existence. You're having an encounter, a direct encounter with God. And there's still people, lots of people who have these. They have them quite regularly. But these authors' argument is that, look, that's chemistry. That's brain-based. That's something that we can deduce. Sometimes there are symptoms of um, psychiatric illness. Um, sometimes we can uh, give you a, a hallucinogenic drug and induce those kinds of feelings. Um, so how you see these uh, depends upon the theoretical uh, structure that you impose on the thing you're observing. Um, and what I've got here is just a quote from William Gibson, one of my favorite science fiction authors, who said, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. It sort of depends on who, you're who you talk to about how to understand that phenomena, right? Um, uh, that behavior looks like demon possession to somebody. Um, well, you know, in the town I grew up in, Missouri, there were people who routinely cast out demons. They thought it was still happening, right? So uh, the future is not very evenly distributed to some little town in Missouri where I grew up, but you, you know, get somebody into um, Harvard Medical Clinic and they're going to evaluate this thing according to um, the, the psychiatric causes and the neuro neuroscientific causes. All right, you take my point. So the EM theorists then ask the same question, what about mind? And they introduce this notion of folk psychology. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about this quite a bit for a couple of lectures. But folk psychology is the theory, they say, that you use, that I use, that your mom used, that your uncle uses, that all of us use, that the, that the folk use. Not the experts, not the neuroscientists, um, not somebody who's at the cutting edge of, of um, you know, cognitive research in um, some lab somewhere, but the normal people, the way we all talk at home around the dinner table. And what do we, what, what concepts, what theories, what principles do we invoke there? Well, we use things like belief. We think the humans have beliefs. We think humans have will. I didn't have enough willpower to resist that quart, that pint of Ben and Jerry's in the fridger, a refrigerator. Uh, they have desire. You have some subconscious uh, desires or goals or beliefs. You have consciousness. Um, you have a soul. You have a real self, perhaps. You have a self. You have a you have fears. You have hopes, intentions, goals, etc. That's all perfectly normal, um, ordinary, uh, familiar language that we use to talk about minds. So now you can anticipate what's going to happen here is that the EM theorists go, that's all demon talk. These things you thought you were investigating, those are all sort of antique, um, horribly outdated ways to carve up the world. Okay, so we got to get there. So folk psychology then is the theory that non-expert folk use to explain human behavior. And we can't get by without it. I mean, that's how we operate in the store and the restaurant and how I, that's how I'm able to drive up to an intersection with you at the other side of the intersection and you stop at the stoplight because um, I assume because you uh, believe that it's not your turn to go and you don't want to be hit by somebody else and you've got mental states that are like mine. And I use all that language and that theory to describe and understand your behavior and you do about mine as well. So the question then for the EM theorist is, will our investigations into the brain lead to the revision or the elimination of these terms? At the very least, they need to be revised. Um, we can't assume that the way we were talking about the mind 500 years ago is going to still fit with the way we understand the mind when we look into the brain now. So at the very least, they need to be revised. And in more radical cases, they may need to be just thrown out altogether, get rid of it altogether. Um, so it turns out that uh, maybe the, the philosophy of your philosophy of mind class teaches you um, that the thing we started looking at in mind isn't actually a thing. Um, so the so their class turns out to be like an astrology class. Um, okay, so some more uh, expansion on the idea here. What what's the currency of the mind, or another way to think of it is what is the what are the units that constitute the traffic of mental states? What's going on in there, and how do we carve it up? And you'll sort of recognize this talk from our discussion of functionalism too. For centuries, the obvious answer has been concepts, propositions, or ideas. That's the way we all still talk. All every philosopher on my hall um, who's going to talk about um, well anything in philosophy is going to invoke concepts and beliefs and ideas. All the philosophers use those ideas. 
Um, that is, minds contain, they transfer, manipulate, organize, and employ symbols. And these symbols stand for things. Beliefs are constructed from symbols. Um, you know, I have a belief about a dog having paws. Um, and those are the symbols. I use the, the, use the English terms to stand for the thing. It symbolizes something. And then logic is the set of rules that governs the relationship of the beliefs. Now, you'll re recognize some of this way of framing things from my uh, connectionism lecture that I gave last time. Um, and that's not an accident. That's all going to feed right in here. Um, eliminative materialism, at least some of the more radical versions of it, wants to reject all of those uh, concepts, all of those folk psychological ideas. Okay, so the, the more narrow question then that we're asking is, are beliefs real? What is a belief? Is it a thing? Well, what are they according to folk psychology? They have features. We can, uh, we can tease out the implicit assumptions about what the nature or what beliefs are in our folk psychological discussions. For one thing, um, beliefs have proposition, something they call propositional modularity. Um, and what that means is there's a, there's a functionally discrete thing. A belief is in a cognitive system is like, uh, it's like a sentence and you can acquire the sentence. You can think, um, uh, there, you know, there, there were turkeys in my front yard earlier. So now I've got this proposition in mind that there are turkeys in the front yard. That's a distinct, distinct Proposition, it has a subject, it have, has a verb, it has a direct, direct object. Turkeys are in the yard. Um, and that all takes up residence in my, head, in my head. And I gain the belief or I lose the belief depending on what happens. Right? And that's the sort of the, this functionally discrete unit that we think of as being the thing that moves in and out of the economy of mind. Okay, so furthermore, beliefs are about things. Uh, another way of understanding this is to say that beliefs are semantically interpretable. When somebody has a belief, that's the way we unpack that is that the belief is about something in the world. When Smith sees a dog nearby, she forms the belief, or I form the belief there's turkeys in the yard, and she forms the belief that there's a dog nearby. Now there's a content in the mind, there's a representation inside the mind that's about, that refers outside the mind to the dog and its location that Smith just acquired a propositional attitude about. So the belief is about or directed at a thing out in the world. Although that maybe sounds so obvious that it hardly bears mentioning, or it seems weird that I'm emphasizing, you know, all of those ideas. But you'll see in a second when we start to unpack this, um, what it would mean to reject that and how the eliminative materialists want to throw it out in favor of a distributed uh, connectionist account of what's going on inside the economy of the mind. And you've already been prepped for that. Um, furthermore, the presence or absence of a belief in the mind uh, plays a causal role. The presence, once it's in there, it has a causal impact. So it is a, it's a, it's an, it's an item that goes into the system and then changes other parts of the system. Um, they bring about other beliefs or behaviors, and the presence of a belief helps us predict dispositions, predict behavior, um, predict other beliefs. They're all connected up, and we think of them as all having sort of causal relationships. Um, and this may sound familiar from the stuff I talked about uh, last time uh, about Jerry Fodor. What language do beliefs employ, or what language are beliefs in? Um, and Fodor reasoned famously that an English speaker and a Spanish speaker have the same belief. So whatever it is that they share in common, it can't be the thing that's in English or the thing that's in Spanish. There must be something underlying. Um, so that the terms in Spanish and the terms in English refer to the same thing. And that's what we're saying that when we say um, that uh, the English speaker and the Spanish speaker are thinking the same thing. Well, they're not thinking the same language, but there's something deeper, um, uh, some substrate uh, that their language dresses that is the same units that are moving around in those two different minds. So Fodor re reasoned that there must be some language of thought that's the currency in the economy of mind. And I've talked about this at some length in the last lecture. Okay, furthermore, logic is going to be in the mind too. Uh, and the reasoning, or at least the illustration, is something like this. Look, if I've got the belief that there's a bear rummaging in the garbage, that's logically related to my other belief, there's a mammal rummaging in the garbage. Um, and I also believe there is not an island rummaging in the garbage. 
So I've got all those beliefs and they're logically connected to each other. To think that it's a bear means it's not an island. To think that it's a bear means that it, it is a mammal. And things that are implied or things are connected by that. If a mammal is searching for food, then it must be hungry. And if the bear is a mam, uh, the bear is a mammal searching for food. Therefore, the bear rummaging in the garbage is hungry. So you see how these concepts about desire, about belief, about logical connection between classes all are connected up here. And you're able to, for instance, look at that little argument and see immediately that that's the implication, that that follows, the conclusion follows from the other premises. And people who were sympathetic to this approach thought that that sort of logical capacity must be built into the fabric of the mind. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do it, and I wouldn't be able to do it. There's something logical about what's going on inside the mind. So whatever a good theory of mind must do, it needs to explain that logic. So logic's in there too, and that's to say that beliefs are sort of wrapping all those points together. Beliefs are functionally, logically discrete units that are encoded in the language of thought, and the commerce of the functional relationships is governed by logic. Um, so that's the sort of items that are being moved down the assembly line and having operations done to them and then sent out through the output slot on the other side of the system. Um, okay, so uh, part of what they were struggling with, that is the language of thought folks, or people who are sympathetic with the with the folk psychology approach is they're trying to figure out at what level in the system do meaning, logic, semantics, reference, and representation exist. Those are all things that we know we do and that we know we have and you understand the meaning of my terms and you're able to make logical inferences. So those um, must exist and be um, implicit or built into the structure of the mind down inside there. And their answer was uh, the, that is the folk psychology folks. Um, their answer was that roughly the way we talk about beliefs should be reflected down in the theoretical structure of an adequate theory of mind. So whatever we're looking for to understand how the structure works in there, it must be that that stuff tracks down and emerges or, or that it, um, it's in there. Okay, that, well, that's what the eliminative materialists are going to reject. Um, they're going to argue that trying to find those things in the mind is like demon talk. You're chasing after uh, a humor theory of disease here. This is just not going to pan out. It's it's so wrong-headed. It can't even. It's not even wrong. It just doesn't even map onto the reality of what's happening in brains. Okay, so I've already mentioned the connection to connectionism. So eliminative materialists, materialists reject that this whole idea that beliefs are expressed in the language of thought, they're functionally discrete, they're causal units with logical relationships to each other, they throw that out, and they say and said, instead that a belief, insofar as it is anything at all, is a set of weighted activation potentials distributed across a connectionist network. All right, so that's weird, but you're actually in a good place to understand that now. We've thought about the way a neural network works for the last two weeks, and we realize that what happens with neurons is that repeated activation in parallel across this network changes the connection weights of all the nodes in the network. And as a result of usually backpropagation in the simple artificial neural network examples, as a result of training or learning, the system becomes better and better at, say, identifying cat pictures or whatever it is. So um, we might say very loosely about a simple artificial neural network that um, when it outputs a, uh, a picture of a cat and then it labels it correctly as a cat, we might say, oh, the system believes that's a cat. Now, where's the belief? Is the belief down inside the system somewhere? Well, not really. There's a diffuse, sub-symbolic, distributed set of weighted nodes here that are crunching uh, the numbers that, are, that, that represent functions across this sort of cascading parallel network. And the cat identifying capacity is there somehow, but also a lot of other capacities are there. And it's not like there's a discrete um, unit or a discrete thing cat that's down in there, or even a belief about a cat. It's more like the network has got this set of, uh, this distributed set of propensities to give certain kinds of outputs in certain circumstances. 
That's more like what a real human brain is, and that's what an artificial neural network is like. So belief, insofar as it is anything at all in a human, turns out to not be what the folk psychology sympathetic folks thought it was in the first place. Um, insofar as there's anything to map at all, they are distributed, probabilistically related, non-discrete, degradable, not modular, and so on. So beliefs, we end up losing a good handle on what a belief is when we start following the connectionist path or the modern neuroscientific explanation. And there's some of the concepts from the connectionism discussion. We said that those networks are, are parallel distributed processing, they're not serial, and they have different layers, and they have connection weights. And you'll recall some of these concepts from the uh, lectures and the discussion in uh, Stuff Will Be um, the readings from last week. So where's the belief? Well, that's one of millions of other nodes that are all hooked up in parallel in a, in a network. Um, it's, not it's not as simple as saying that there's a belief in there that's getting moved around and changed by logic. Um, logic or beliefs are what come out at the output side, but the input sides are more sub-symbolic or distributed or different than that, different in nature. And we also looked at this animation of uh, a bunch of these simple artificial neural networks that were correctly identifying handwritten numerals and putting them into the right categories, say, identifying, for instance, that this is a nine, a handwritten nine, a sloppy handwritten nine. And there's a bunch of different ways you can construct an artificial neural network to correctly identify the nine. So now, where's the concept of nine in one of these? Um, I'll refer you back to the last lecture on connectionism. You watched the whole video. Well, the concept's distributed. It's across the whole network. Um, the whole network's doing some work to actually give the output nine here at the end. Um, the, so it's not like the, the sort of um, the logic discrete functional unit that the way we thought about it pre-connectionism um, with Fodor and Chomsky and the like. Okay, so really what we're getting at then is remember my drawing and my analysis at the beginning where I said we started with a caveman notion of fire. We had a bunch of uh, common sense ideas about what was included or should be included in the concept under the heading of fire. And then we embark in this centuries long investigation into the nature of fire and we end up uh, discovering that heat is mean molecular kinetic motion that it has to do with kinetic energy in the molecules of the substance. Turns out to be something radically different than what we thought. So now what about that transition from our old school notion of mind with belief, will, desire, memory, goals, and so on? How is that going to uh, transfer to the new account of what consciousness is, post-connectionism or post-neuroscience, um, and what the Eliminative materialists are arguing is that, uh, look, the things we're ending up putting on the list under consciousness are not really resembling the things that we started with at all. And in many cases, we're going to have to throw a bunch of them out. Uh, belief, for instance, is going to be thrown out. So the, there's a couple ways to put this. The modest or uncontroversial claim coming from eliminative materialism is that we should be cognizant that terms, theories, and theoretical entities shift as we investigate, we discover, and we learn. And we should be prepared to revise, update, redefine, or even eliminate when that will serve our theoretical account of mind better. We need to learn our lessons from history about how um, to rebuild our theories as our inquiry gets underway. The more radical or controversial position within the EM range of positions is beliefs are like demons. Uh, will is like phlogiston, another famously wrong-headed physics concept. Consciousness itself is an illusion. You get some of them even arguing that consciousness is not real. Abandon your medieval pursuits. Uh, okay, so... On this account, then, the currency in the economy of mind does not beliefs. It's sub-symbolic. That was my point about the nines. Connectionism gives us a way to describe mind structures that is abstract. It's non-anthropocentric. It's empirically accurate, and it's sub-symbolic. And EM, eliminative materialism, and connectionism are compatible. So they're not the same position, but in many cases, uh, eliminative materialists have taken up connectionism as a better theory about what's going on, how to understand minds, um, than, the, than the folk psychological view. 
both suggest that our framework for understanding mind is outdated and needs to be radically revised. Okay, so in my second uh, eliminative materialism lecture, I want to look at some of the actual arguments and talk about some of the different positions and look at some objections and some of the specifics about the view.